Okay, so we left off. We were talking about gross muscle anatomy uh, and using this figure to take a look at how each level of the muscle is bundled together. And we had three different layers of connective tissue called fascia that we wanted to identify. And the innermost layer is called the endomesium. And the endomesium is a connective tissue layer. that surrounds individual fibers. So you can see the endomesium here wrapping around this individual fiber or muscle cell. This is going to be extracellular fluid or will contain extracellular fluid that's the main interface for ion exchange. Interface. Interface. So the main point of, of contact with the cell. In addition to being that main point of fluid contact for the cell and the extracellular fluid, is the endomesium also allows space around each fiber so that fiber can be vasculated or can have a vascular supply. Now, if we take individual muscle fibers and we bundle them together, we bundle them up into what's known as a fascicle. And this whole fascicle, which you can see represented here, all of these are individual muscle fibers. The whole collective bundle is a fascicle. And it's going to be surrounded by another connective tissue called paramecium. Paramecium is the connective tissue that is going to wrap multiple muscle fibers together. And again, these multiple muscle fibers bundled together or wrapped together, that whole structure is called a fascicle. Now, in this bundle, the fascicle, we're going to contain, within this paramecium, larger vessels and also a group of receptors called stretch receptors. which contain muscle spindles and will help to send nervous signal back to the central nervous system so that we can maintain a picture of what's going on in the muscle, how long it is, what its position is. All of this contained within that paramecium surrounding each of our individual fascicles. Now, once we go up to the level of the whole muscle, you can see we have multiple fascicles that are wrapped up and contained within another connective tissue layer. This outer layer is going to be the epimesium. So this is that connective tissue layer over the whole muscle. And what you can see is this very outer layer, which we do have some additional blood supply in there. But 
we eventually move into paramecium. So the paramecium and the endomecium, I'm sorry, epimecium are actually sort of connected together and we just transition as we go deeper inside of that muscle. Now, individual muscles such as biceps brachii or rectus femoris or vastus lateralis, these are individual organs within the muscle system. And so we can look at each of these individual organs and we can detail some of their characteristics. And one of the big characteristics that we can detail about these muscles are just their simple shape. What are they actually shaped like? What do they look like? Okay, so what are the main muscle shapes that we need to be aware of? Well, before we get into specifics of muscle shapes, why are muscles shaped the way that they are shaped? And really what it comes down to is how each of these fascicles is oriented within the organ. So a muscle shape is due to fascicle orientation, and it is going to be this orientation that's going to be used to name the muscle types. So here are a variety of different shapes muscle shape types, and you actually may recognize some of the names based off of the shape of muscle that you're looking at. So first one over here is the fusiform shape. And that fusiform shape is going to be thick towards the middle of the muscle or the belly of the muscle and will converge and taper towards the ends. So clearly you can see that this is much wider here and it tapers down here towards the tendon. Now, there are a variety of muscles that fall into this fusiform category. The example that they're giving here is one of the bellies of biceps brachii. Triceps brachii would fall in this category. The gastrocnemius would fall in this category. So brachii, bicep, bicep brachii is just one of our examples. The next muscle type is this muscle type that's parallel, and so the fascicles are actually going to run in parallel to each other. So over long distances, the fascicles all run parallel to each other, and so this provides a rectangular shape for this particular muscle. As you can see here, these have a very rectangular appearance. That's rectus abdominis, or part of rectus abdominis. Uh, if they run over shorter distances, then that rectangle becomes shunted and it appears more like a square. 
but still maintains that overall parallel nature, rectangular or square-like. And the example here will be rectus abdominis, which is what accounts for colloquially what would be called the six-pack. Unless you're a humongous fat guy and then you make some joke about it's a whole keg. Sorry, so on that, would it be like, like, I'm not other than this is a question. I just want you to know that. So, that thing gives you two of those and make a six pack or a lot of those. You see what I'm saying? That's a three pack. That's what I'm asking. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you basically only have half of the, uh, of the, I was going to say the money, half of the <laughs> muscle, <laughs> half of the muscle, the other half would be separated by a long tendon and a muscle that surrounds the umbilical cord called the, called the umbilicus, or I guess the, the belly button called the umbilicus. So yeah, that's just the three pack. Where else would you find parallel muscles? Um, the, some of the muscles in the hand and the foot have parallel um, appearances. Um, the rib muscles, the, uh, the intercostal muscles, have a um, have a parallel a parallel shape. Our next muscle here is the convergent muscle, and what you're going to notice here is it looks like it only really has one tendon, and in fact it has two tendons. But we're going to find out that the tendon on the other side of the muscle is just really, really small. Can it's very thin. You can also call it the triangular, right? Okay. The convergent? Yeah, you could you could refer to it as triangular or fan shape, and that's what I was just about to right here. So triangular or fan shape, and it, it it's a dual tendon muscle, or there's tendons on either side of this muscle. Example here, just kind of pouring ahead, pectoralis major. Uh, on one side, it converges down and attaches into the shoulder, and then on the other side, it attaches into the sternum. And on that sternal side, that sternal border, it's a very thin, thread-like tendon that runs the length of the muscle. So that tendon is going to be a small insertion on the one side, on the sternal side of pectoralis major. And then on the shoulder side of pectoralis major, we have the larger insertion that looks the opposite side. It looks much more like a tendon you are probably more familiar with. So again here, pectoralis major would be an example. Pectoralis minor, gluteus maximus and minimus are also examples of convergent or triangular muscles. Now the next category, and, and I'm going to take these three here and I'm going to put them all into one category, just kind of for brevity's sake. Those are pennate muscles, and we basically have three different levels. We have uni, bi, and multi-pennate. And really, the, the pennate is referring to how the tendon sets inside of these muscles. And so what you're, what you're looking at here is the tendon actually runs the length of the muscle. You can see here in the bipennate, it runs through the center. And then multipennate has multiple tendons running up through it. And then the, each individual fiber runs sort of at an angle to that, that long tendon.
So the unipenate uh, muscle example here would be palmar inner osseous. Bipenate, and we could give an example of rectus femoris, and then multipenate. And the example there would be the deltoid muscle over the shoulder. Now, when you look at this, hopefully you kind of see a feather, sort of. So these muscles are going to have a feather shape. And you remember, or think about a bird's feather, you have the quill, and then off of the quill you have the individual components of the feather, okay? So that's the feather shape where the quill is the tendon, and this is going to run the length of the muscle. Again, that being like the quill. And the bird's feather. And then the meat of the muscle, the muscle cells themselves, would be the other parts of that feather. The final muscle here is a circular muscle, and the, the example they're giving here is the muscle that surrounds the eye, which is um, orbicularis oculi. We also have orbicularis forus around the mouth uh, to control, basically, lip movement. Uh, and then within the body, there are some portions of, uh, of systems that are circular muscles that act as sphincters to close and open up and maintain the openings of certain um, portions of the, of the body. So circular, they're going to basically control openings, whether it's the mouth or the eyes or parts of the digestive system or reproductive tracts. So when these contract, they close an opening or a passageway. So contraction closes an opening or passage. So as you're looking at each of these different types of muscles, what you're noticing is they all basically have tendons. Some of the tendons are very small, as we have on a lot of these muscles. Others are very, very noticeable. Whatever the case may be, those tendons are going to act to attach the muscle primarily to bones, but also to some other organs, in particular uh, muscles in the face. Uh, for facial expression, aren't really going to be attached necessarily to bone on both sides of the muscle, and then for eye movement, are not attached to both sides um, to muscle. So we can also further quantify or clarify muscles and types of muscles based off of their attachment. So for muscle attachments, the attachments are extensions of connective tissue. In other words, the endomesium, paramecium, and my, uh, uh, epimesium convert, converge to eventually form a tendon. 
And there are going to be two types of muscle attachment. And they are going to be indirect and direct. Indirect would indicate that the muscle doesn't directly attach to the bone, it attaches through the tendon. Direct, on the other hand, would indicate that the muscle directly attaches to the bone and doesn't require a tendon. That's a fallacy, though. Direct attachments are only direct in appearance. They actually are not direct connections of muscle to another organ, such as a bone or other tissue. Uh, they just appear as if there's no intervening tendon, but every muscle has tendon attachments to bones and other tissues. So we're going to start out with indirect attachments. So here are some examples of what we would refer to as indirect attachments. You can see that it's a very noticeable tendon that goes from the bone onto the muscle or the muscle onto the bone, such as here, the Achilles tendon that runs from the gastrocnemius muscle to the calcaneus bone. Why is it indirect? Well, it's indirect because it appears that the muscle comes up short. And so to span that gap between the muscle and the bone or the other organ, we add in or we have the attachment occur through a tendon. So the attachment is made by a tendon. So attachments made by the tendon appears that the tendon or that the muscle falls short or comes up short. So we add in the tendon. Now exactly the ten what is the tendon? Well those mesiums, that's probably not really a proper way to say that, but paramesium, endomesium, epimesium, they converge out of their level of organization, so from the muscle fiber, the fascicle, and the whole muscle, all of those mesiums converge and begin to form the tendon, okay? And that a tendon is going to extend to travel to the bone. And as we go from one side of this attachment to the other, this tendon is going to slowly become less muscle-like and more bone-like as we travel from muscle to bone. So you said it becomes more, more um, bone-like? It's more bone-like. So this mesium, this connective tissue, as we, this is very muscle-like here, and as we travel down towards the bone, that mesium is actually going to form the matrix for mineralization. So it forms basically the structure for minerals to be deposit, deposited. And as we move towards the bone, closer and closer to the bone, more and more minerals are deposited. So the tendon becomes harder and harder and harder until basically we flu uh, fluidly just transition into bone. So if we were to kind of track through here, starting on this side, it would be muscle-like, less muscle-like, less, less muscle, more mineral, more mineral, more mineral, like bone, like bone, until we get to bone. Does that make sense? Now, there are, in addition to these tendons that are very obvious, tendons, there's two additional uh, indirect attachments that we need to be familiar with.
there is a tendon that is called an aponeurosis. That's how you would pronounce that word. Apo, aponeurosis. And this is going to be an indirect attachment that has a fan-like shape. So aponeuroses are fan-shaped tendons. And that's what you can actually see here in the hand here. This would be the palm of the hand, the tendon that attaches to allow your fingers to close up into a fist, pulling on those, part of, part of that motion is accomplished through this fan-shaped aponeurosis. A second indirect attachment is going to be a tendon called a reticulum. The reticulum, and you can see an example of a reticulum here, is a band-like connective tissue. And this reticulum is actually more of a support structure. And it is going to wrap around or across other tendons. So wraps perpendicular across other tendons. And by doing this, by wrapping a reticulum around and across other tendons, it's going to provide guidance for other tendons, other indirect attachments. And it's going to act somewhat like a bridge. So it provides guidance and acts like a bridge. All of you have probably heard of carpal tunnel syndrome before. The carpal tunnel, tunnel is a reticulum that's wrapped around the wrist, goes right around the wrist, kind of like a watch band. It helps to guide the tendons through the, the wrist that attaches to the finger so we can move the fingers. And if that get, gets inflamed and increases and causes some pain and it causes uh, discomfort when you move your hand, it's carpal tunnel syndrome, which is plain, kind of a play on words here that those reticulums act like a bridge or provide a tunnel passageway underneath the reticulum. All right, so what was the other type of attachment? Grand attachments. Did you have a question, David? Yeah, can't you have like carpal tunnel surgery? Yeah. So what do they do? That's a good question. Um, I'm not really too sure. My okay. guess is, is they probably go in there and they make decisions to the carpal um, through the carpal reticulum to allow it to expand over into the car. I mean that's what I have to put. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. It's a good thing you just teach theology. I'm pretty good at serving, aren't I? I'm pretty good at seeing. You see me in action. Right. I just have never done an all star puddle surgery. Okay. <laughs> All right, direct attachment. <clears throat> so only by name. With a direct attachment muscle, the, the muscle simply appears to attach directly to the bone. So only appears to attach directly to the bone.
appearance only. Now, when we look at it in enough detail, so maybe we'll call this microscopic examination, under microscopic examination, we begin to see enough detail that there's actually attachment that exists. And most of the attachment here, there's just a short little gap between the muscle and the bone or the other tissue that's spanned by collagen fibers. So collagen fibers cross that very short gap. And as you can see here, things like pectoralis major has a very direct attachment or direct appearing attachment to the sternal border. Small little collagen fibers make that the transition between that small little gap to attach pectoralis major to the sternum. On the other side though, and you can't see it as well here, but we actually have a direct and indirect attachment through a tendon uh, into the shoulder uh, of the individual. Okay, another characteristic that we can use to describe a muscle is we can actually look at how it's generally oriented within the body. And there's actually two systems that have been used historically to describe the general orientation of a muscle. Uh, I'm going to talk about the first system, which is the retro system. This system is old or maybe even put in hand imperfect. So the old or imperfect system, this is going to be our retro system. And that's what I'm illustrating here. What you can see is that I use qualifiers to identify where the muscle is attached. And I give those names, the, the uh, attachments are given specific names so that we can identify each individual attachment by specific name. So in this old system, we're going to start by saying that the skeletal muscle is going to span a joint. And whenever we move a joint, so here I'm showing that I'm moving my elbow, I'm flexing my elbow. Notice that this part of the joint, that bone stays stable. It's not moving, whereas the forearm is moving a lot, right? So no movement here, a lot of movement here. So the muscle spans that joint, and I'm going to have attachment below the joint, and I'm going to have an attachment above the joint. The, in this case, the uh, attachment that's above the joint is associated with the stationary link. Whereas the, the attachment that is below the joint is associated with that movable link, the moving part of the joint. So in this old imperfect system, we would evaluate the attachments based off of how the bones move in that joint. So one of the bones is stationary. The muscle and tendon that are closest or that are uh, connected to, attached to that stationary bone, the muscle and tendon here are going to make an attachment through what's known as the origin. So here's my elbow joint, and you can see this is the stationary link. And we make our attachment, really, it's, I've been saying up in the shoulder, but really it's associated with the scapula. And those 
those uh, attachments there are going to be the origin because they're closest to this stationary link, the non-moving link. Then we move down, and you can see we move into the belly of the muscle. So the middle of the muscle <clears throat> will be the belly. And then finally, we'll come across. What was that? What's that? That was my phone. That was your phone? I know what it sounded like. I'm not saying what it sounded like. It just sounded like an old squeaky door. <laughs> you go on to your iPhone store and old squeaky door ringtone. <laughs> so belly is the middle of the muscle, and then we get to the other link that's the moving bone. And that, move, that bone that moves, the attachment that's going to be closest to that the attachment here will be the insertion. Now the biggest problem and the thing that became so complicated about this is the term insertion in origin are going to be dependent upon the movement. So dependent upon the movement. So in this example here of flexing the elbow, the origin is up here on the scapula. The insertion is down here on in the forearm. But what if I move and now I flex the hand? So now my movable link is down here on below the wrist, and the stationary link is above the wrist. So originally I had an insertion here, so now things like brachioradialis, the origin is actually going to be where the insertion was for biceps brachii. Whereas the origin, I'm sorry, uh, insertion is now going to be even further away. And so because it's movement dependent, it's a very complicated system to deal with. In two different motions, I have an origin and an insertion right around the same area. What does it say after origin? Terminology. Terminology are movement dependent. So because of this movement bias, there's been a new system that's been developed that tries to rectify the issues that arise out of this bias towards using movement. And so rather than just simply using things like origin insertion, which are going to seem to change, we're rather going to use positional descriptors. Okay, so positional descriptors. I'm going to try to illustrate this new system with just some specific examples. So the muscle biceps brachii found here in the upper forelimb. Biceps brachii is going to have two attachments. You're going to have the attachments on the scapula, and really you're attaching into the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa and the coracoid process, and then we're going to have an attachment on the radius, the fascia of the forearm. Those are going to be my two uh, points of attachment. Old system, we call them origin and insertion.
what's a lot easier to use and what's going to eliminate that movement bias is just simply to say proximal and distal. So we'll have a proximal attachment that's attached to the glenoid cavity in the coracoid process. Here would be my proximal attachment. And then we would have a distal attachment. And that's going to be attached here to the radius and the fascia of the forearm. Now, we're using descriptive terms. We're using anatomically descriptive terms. So it's not always going to be proximal and distal, right? It's going to depend on the location of the muscle within <clears throat> the organism. So we're going to go through and we're going to try to apply the old system and the new system to the muscle rectus abdominis. Okay, so rectus abdominis. Where exactly is rectus abdominis? It's what makes up the three pack or the six pack or the eight pack or the twelve pack. I'm so genetically modified. So now that we know where that muscle is, talk about my attachments. What are going to be the old system attachments? Okay, origin insertion. And where am I going to find the origin? Where am I going to find the insertion? Okay, so origin is not moving though. Okay, and where's my move, where's my moving bone and my non-moving bone? Is your moving bone spot? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sternum? Chest? Ribs? No, no, no. No, Bottom of the sternum. Anyone know what that's called before? It's a process. Your life. Is it xiphoid process? Xiphoid process. Xiphoid, xiphoid. Xylophone process. Xylophone. Xylophone, yep. The xiphoid process. And then the costal cartilage of ribs 5, 6, and 7. Okay. You might call that the insertion. The um, other insertion here for rectus abdominis is going to be uh, associated with the pubis bone. Remember, pubis is one of those three bones that we find in the pelvic girdle. It's actually going to attach into what's known as the pubic symphysis, which is that point in the middle of the pubis. It's that joint in the middle of, uh, of the pelvis in the front where the two pubis bones come together. Uh, and then it's also going to attach onto the, the superior margin of the pubis bone. Where does it go up? No, no, no. Oh, Rectus your your abdominis. <laughs> your ribs. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Rectus abdominis does go that far. Oh, wow. And it goes down into the pelvic bone, attaching onto the pubis, the, the superior um, marginal border, and then also. Um, the uh, pubic synthesis, and then up here, xiphoid process, and ribs, costal cartilage of ribs 5, 6, and 7. So pretty tough. I mean, once you knew where they were, you maybe could sort of get at it, but who's to say that this isn't really good? So it's pretty hard to actually say insertion and origin. What do you think would be better terms? Superior and inferior. Superior and inferior. So superior attachment will be a diploid process and then costal cartilage 5 through 7. And then inferior, which will be pubic synthesis and then the superior margin of pubis bone. Okay, so proximal distal primarily we're going to reserve this for the limbs, upper and lower limbs. And then superior, inferior typically are going to be the trunk and kind of the middle axis of the body.
Now, this new system, and using it, we can actually be movement independent. And when immediately was able to tell us superior and inferior, and that gives us no guessing room. Because we actually could have pulled the room, and I could have done my movement here, told you where the, the joints were, and we might have actually had a 50-50 split on which was the insertion and which was the orc. But 100% would have to say this is superior and this is inferior. There's no other way to determine. Right? So it's a much better system because of that movement independence. All right, now before we move on away from uh, the attachments, most of our bones, or I'm sorry, most of our muscles, skeletal muscles, are going to be attached from bone to bone. But there are going to be some muscles that attach to non-bone tissues. And this is actually where it becomes even better to use this new system. In particular, we have muscles in the face that provides facial expression. Some facial expression muscles. So there are going to be muscles that help to elevate the lip or move the lip over towards one side. And if we talk about insertion and origin, it's going to be really hard to determine insertion and origin for these muscles. But I can tell you, if I have a muscle right here, what are my attachments going to be? Medial and lateral. And it's very, very simple to use. So you basically can look at some of these more complex muscles and based off of their position, you just simply use the descriptors and you're going to nail it every single time on where the two points of attachment exist. Is everybody good? 